Welcome back, everyone, to CIS 126. Once again, I'm your instructor, Victor Campos. So we're getting very, very close to the end of the semester, and we've got our game project to work on. So last week, you needed to create a, a project file. You needed to create five scenes. They didn't need to be very detailed. They just needed to be five scenes. And this week, we'll talk about the coding to be able to navigate from scene to scene. We'll talk about the coding to interact with stuff on the screen, picking stuff up, for example, um, moving around in a project. And as I started to say last week, well, the final project uh, is going to be a culmination of the actual code and things that we will learn. So if you if it makes sense what we're doing in the lectures, in the coding, you should be able to do this final project. And I'm going to say it over and over, but there's always this icing on the cake of uh, what you can always add more to on a project. At the minimum, what I'm going to show, if you're able to do that, you should get a good grade on the final project. Maybe you had 20 things you wanted to accomplish for your game and you did three of them. That's fine. If you did the required coding 100%, then you'll get a good grade. But if in your if in your mind you had a vision to make this amazing project with so much interactivity and so many side quests and so many hidden Easter eggs and all of that, and you only got to 1% of it, that's fine. If you understand the coding, if you do the coding, you can add on to that in the future. So um, as such, I've got here available already the final project. Um, the final project requirements. Let's take a quick look at this. You can look at the other items on your own in a moment because I want to get straight to the coding. Let me preview what the final project is here. It's worth 20 points, so it's double a regular assignment, but that's the same as with the movie. The movie was also 20 points. So you're going to create this adventure game. Oh no, I had the idea to create XYZ type of game. Again, together we're learning, especially as a beginner, a lot about coding, but not everything. And even if you're taking a complete semester, 16 weeks, that's still not enough to learn everything on coding. Coding and programming and all of that is a whole college major. Game design and all of that is a whole college major. In the summer that you're taking this, it's a very intense, very quick class that covers a little bit of everything, but then that's why you go off further to UCSD, San Diego State, the Art Institute, etc and get more education on this topic to be a more viable candidate if you choose to go into game design and we've seen game design and such is not just the coding maybe the coding isn't my big strength maybe the character design the background design the animation the tweening the key poses the scripting uh the sales pitch of it all there's you're going to find a place that you like in this world of gaming and animation and so on this final project, it's going to be a culmination of the model sheet, the storyboard, the animated movie project that you should be done with it this week, definitely. And it's going to continue the ideas you started previously, that script, that drabble, the character biography, the storyboard, which then becomes the movie. And most of you then are doing a to be continued. Well, here's the continue. Here's the conclusion of that continuation. Now it's an interactive thing with your character moving from screen to screen in a dungeon, in a forest, in a city, in an office building. They're moving around. They're interacting with things to get to the end of their quest, their adventure. So I'm calling this generically the adventure game final project. You will write the code, you will create the visual assets, the sprites and such, you will add music, etc. Here's a lot of detail of what the final project needs to be, which of course we'll cover together during these uh, next four lectures, you know, two and a half hour lectures, uh, that's five hours per week, that's 10 hours still left, 10 hours of lecture left to, to learn the code. And if you're able to complete what I show you, by the end of a lecture, you're on track. If your code works, by the end of my lecture of what I show you, you're on track. You're going to be able to succeed. You're going to get the code working, definitely. Now, the visual assets, maybe in the beginning, they're stick figures. That's fine. The important part that I'm going to focus on, of course, for the final project is the main idea is that the code works. 
and the stick figureness of it all is not going to hurt your grade. If you spend too much time on the visuals and the code doesn't work, that's what's going to hurt your grade. But I'm looking for you to create a project file, landscape, certain dimensions, and frame rate. I'm going to look for, jumping here, at least seven scenes where you will have a title screen, an about screen, a good ending, a bad ending, and then some screens of more navigation, more adventure, more interactivity. So at least three scenes. You can do more than that if you want. If you do six scenes, that's not a perfect grade. If you do seven scenes, that's a perfect grade in this section. Sound. We're going to have sound, various different sounds that play via code. We saw a little bit about putting sound on the timeline. Well, a better way to do sound is via code. That way, sound can trigger once you interact with an element, once you go from scene to scene, once you get to a good ending, bad ending. All of that's going to be done via sound. Sound on the main background and sound when you interact with an element. Of course, your code. You're going to need to be able to move from scene to scene, plot point to plot point, et cetera. You're going to need to uh, do simple interaction with objects, more complex interactions with objects, decision-making conditional statements. Your project needs to be set up correctly for, a, uh, for final publication, icons, uh, aspect ratio, permissions, etc., and then submit a zip file with everything except these. Behind the scenes, animate creates some temporary files and such. Don't upload these temporary files. If you do, that'll hurt your grade. Again, my list of requirements of an assignment is to simulate that in the real world, when the boss asks you for something and you don't do what the boss asks, you might not continue to, to work with them. If you don't do what, you're, what, is, what the teacher asks for you here, you might not get a good grade. Who cares about grades? Because in the real world, the job is more important. So be mindful of this when you turn it all in. Don't include these files. And the reason for this is these just add up more. These add up to just a larger zip file, a, a bigger file to upload, more wasted time uploading the final project of, of material that doesn't matter to me. You wasted my time, your time. So don't include these files. When you make your zip file, delete these files, basically. Make your zip file. And then I'm going to be looking for these files in the zip file when you, un when you upload it. Grading breakdown, uh, I'll add the details right here. There will be a detailed breakdown, which is based on this. I just ran out of time a little bit. So there will be detailed breakdown of the 20 points. These are the various things you need to accomplish, which of course you're going to learn. I'm going to show you all of this. And as the lecture goes on, I will of course upload on, on the live session and in the resources, anything that I can to help you along with completing this project. As a matter of fact, if you look already on the week eight resources, not week eight, week, yeah, week eight, uh, I have here an example of a mostly complete final project. One way that you could do the final weeks of this class, here's a big shortcut, and you wanna decide if you wanna do shortcuts or not, there is a version that is right there, an FLA file that is um, pretty complete. And if you put in your own material there and finish up the little bit of the polish on the code, that could be a way to shortcut the final project. Now, that would be a last resort. I would prefer that you create everything from scratch as I'm about to show you, because that's the better way to learn. But if you're falling behind you feel and you're getting stressed and all of that stuff. I do have a, I do have like a, a safety net right here, but don't consider that until the last resort. And I will put my code examples as I code live. And I will of course be recording this and we will have the Wednesday lab time. And then on the next week, Monday and Wednesday lab time, I highly recommend you come to the lab time uh, to get some one-on-one -on -one help because code stuff can be difficult. And so this is the week eight stuff. Tangibly in our project, 
I had said for you last week to create a um, series of scenes to at least have a starting point. Um, I think I said scene title, scene help, whatever these are called. These can be called anything you want. I had given some examples. Scene main was that one. Then scene end good and scene end bad. I think those are the ones from last week. And I said over the weekend, start to design a little bit of something visual to look at there, and you'll polish it as time goes on. We needed also an actions. Um, uh, layer and a background layer can be spelled properly or not. That's fine. And uh, we'll get started here. So the title scene, if you want to have some sort of animation happen first, a camera movement, a tween, a frame by frame, whatever, that's fine. For the moment, I'll say it over and over, don't focus on the visuals yet. Focus on the code working. If the code works, uh, then you're on the right track. So I'm going to have a super simple adventure. I should probably write it as, as a font. Adventure. Call it my adventure. Yeah, that's the name of the project, the game. So from this title screen, I want to go either to start to play the game or go get help. Go look at the credits, go get a tutorial, go get help or whatever, because I've got a help screen. So I want to go to the help screen in a moment. In order to navigate, I'm going to need some sort of interactive element. And we're going to see in our game, we're going to have either the obvious interactive elements like a button, press this button to start to play, press this button to go to the help screen. You're gonna have other obvious interactive elements um, like here is a key. I'm gonna pick up the key and put it in the keyhole. And then you're gonna have, you could also have non-obvious interactive elements. Be careful about those because you have to think back when you've played games and there's a non-obvious interactive element Usually the better ones have a little hint that they are interactive. I said last time, well, here's this wall that is perfectly smooth, except there's one little thing that kind of looks a little weird about the wall. Maybe if I interact with it, something happens. The worst ones are the whole wall is completely blank and there is an interactive element right there, but there's no way anyone would find it unless they're clicking, 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 clicking. Oops, I found it here. I kind of don't like that. I don't know about you, but do you like playing games like that that are there's no obvious reason to interact with something until you read an FAQ or you click on every single thing and then, oh, I discovered an Easter egg. I think there should always be something that is a hint that something is interactive, maybe a little sparkle on it, maybe a subtle change of color uh, or lighting on it. Here, of course, we need some obvious interactive elements to start the game or to go to the help screen. I'm going to do this by every... and. The good thing is that actually that at least everything that we interact with is going to be a movie clip. Everything is going to be an object. Everything is going to be something that in the project will exist in my library and everything that will be interactive will be interactable via code. So everything that you want to interact with needs to be a symbol, needs to be a movie clip. So knowing that, I'm going to go directly to the library, create a new symbol. I will call this, let's say, title um, BTN uh, help. And these things can be called anything you want. But as I said previously, well, this is something that I know I'm going to find on my title screen. So I'm going to prefix it with title. This is a button I'm going to click on. This is an interactive thing. So I put BTN. And then specifically what button? It's the help button. Um, I'm avoiding spaces. I'm not using special characters. I'm using capital letters. We call it title, BTN help. 
but it's common practice in programming to have your first word lowercase and then subsequent words uppercase for readability. Don't put spaces when we're dealing with code and all of this stuff, this will cause problems. You could put underscores if you want, if that's more readable for you, whatever, whatever way is helpful. If you follow what I'm doing in the lectures, I am, of course, showing the most recommended way to do things. So if you follow my recommendations, you should be OK. Make sure this is a movie clip type. So here I'm going to create a button to interact with. Um, I'm doing this all very, very simply because later on I can continue to refine it. And so this is my starting point design for my help button. So when someone clicks this help button, it'll go to the help screen. I'm currently in the movie clip. I created a brand new movie clip. I knew I was going to have an interactive element, so I created it as a movie clip right away. I'm finished editing it or creating it for the moment. Return to my main timeline. And then I'm going to drop a copy of it. It's way too big. I can easily resize that. And maybe I really love the design of something that I created. Maybe I want to use that torch over and over, uh, but change it slightly. So what about if I start to design a torch that looks correct and then a torch that is kind of like slightly damaged? Maybe that's my way to create the non-obvious interactive elements. I've got a row of torches, but one of them is slightly more scuffed. One of them is slightly, you know, five degrees off. So in my, t in my library, I've got one symbol that they're all perfect. And then I've got one version that is slightly wrong. And that's the one that I'm going to interact with. So I kind of want to do something like that here with another button. I've got my help button, and then I've got my start game project, start start game button. So I can duplicate, right click the symbol, duplicate. I'll call this one on the title screen. It is a button, but not the help. It's the start, start the game. So in my library here, I've got the help button. I've got the start button. Obviously the start button looks exactly the same as my help button. So I need to change it a little bit. Double click it. I'm going to flip it over and and the text will say start. So let's see, select, modify, transform, flip horizontal. That text, since I wrote it manually instead of writing it via a font, just recoloring it to the background and then redrawing. Start. Putting a copy of it on the screen. It's also big. If I want them to be the exact same size, I can look at the info panel right here. Info, this thing is currently 146 by 110. I can make it exactly 145 by 110. And therefore this needs to be 145 and 110. And now they're exactly the same. I can check their X and Y coordinates. So X and Y, Y is down of 360. It's funny that this gives you fractions of a pixel, which are kind of worthless. But now it's perfectly lined downwards, up and down the Y coordinate. I could put guides and all of that to do something nice. But the point is, some sort of title screen, 
maybe once your code is all working, you're going to have first an animation happening. Maybe the camera move around. Maybe something happened. Maybe a, a cinematic cut scene happened first. Maybe I create a brand new scene called scene, you know, cinematic. And in there, I create a cool animation that happens for a moment. Then it comes to this screen. Don't, I don't want to put that in your mind yet. Focus on the code. Focus on the hard part, the code. Then go back and add the polish, the icing on the cake. Because what I want for this is to click to go to my help scene. In order to interact with these elements, I had said previously, tell me in the chat here, get ready to answer on the chat box if you'd like, please. I said previously, I'm going to say this over and over, when you interact with something, in order for the code to know what you clicked on, in order for the code to know what you're interacting with, you need something. You need to set something. Does anyone remember what that something is? All of these symbols that are on my timeline need something set in order for the code to know which one you clicked on. Anyone remember? Tell me in the chat. I'll give you 10 seconds if you remember. But you're going to do this over and over. Whatever you want to click on, drag, whatever boss you're battling. It's, an ins it's a symbol in the library. And then when there's a copy of it on the screen, in order to know the difference between each thing, anyone remember? Nope. Okay, write this down. Instance name. So when you select your symbols on the timeline, remember I showed here in the properties, this is a movie clip. It is an instance of title button help. It has no instance name. The code won't know which one of your 20 buttons you're clicking on unless it has some name. Obviously, you should name these things intelligently. So um, help underscore BTN. You should not use the same name that's in your library. You should use a name that's something like this, where what is the name of the object? You can prefix it via the scene title if you want, but then you're getting a little bit too long with names and such. And then underscore, and then what type of object, what type of interactive thing is it? This is a button, BTN. So that's a help button. This start button also needs an instance name. Basically, this is what I was looking for to answer. Everything that you're going to interact with needs some sort of name with some sort of button, movie clip, text, you know, some sort of name for the code to understand what it is. So uh, this is start BTN. Press enter. Don't forget to press enter to lock in that change. So this will be the number one thing to memorize as you start this. Make sure your um, make sure your your um, elements have instance names. Your interactive objects have instance names. Um, so now it's time to write some code. The actions panel. You're going to use this a lot. So window. Actions, which has a shortcut of F9. I would highly recommend you really set up this panel as you like. You know, make it nice and big so you can see the code you're going to work with, etc. I would also recommend possibly the font of the code to make it larger. I think the regular size is too small. And in order for you to change your font size, you would go up to Edit. Preferences, edit preferences, control U, shortcut. Under code editor, I've got mine set at 24. The default is 10, I think, which is way too small. So two and a half times larger or so, I would recommend whatever size you like. Then OK. So here we go. Previously, we used code snippets and Code snippets can help you accomplish this project, but I'm going to do it the long way. On the lecture here, I'm going to write the code manually. 
uh, so that I can also explain what it does. Uh, all your code needs to work. And I would like that you, at a baseline level, understand what the code is doing. Even if you don't fully understand what the code is doing, as long as you type it properly, it should work. But if you're not a big coder, the way I'm doing here, the, the long way should be a slightly better way to help you rather than just do it for me with code snippets. And the first thing to do, remember forward double slash there is a comment. Um, here we, we would write import uh, packages. All right, so in any programming language, it's full of, let's say, 200 codes, just to pick a random number. And most people are not going to use every code. And with the code we're writing here, which is ActionScript, which is related to JavaScript. So if you've taken a web design class, you've surely heard of JavaScript. So here's the cousin, ActionScript. And the thing about ActionScript is that not all 200 codes are loaded in memory right away for you to use. Uh, a basic amount of packages or collections of code are loaded. So we need to import, we need to load the code that we're actually going to use. So basically everyone's project is gonna have this code at the beginning here, import. Now notice I started to type import and it pops up. Okay, let me further help you. What, what would you like to import of, um, of our possible code. Here's where you can write it manually or you can select your flash. If I double click that, okay, flash dot, furthermore events. Okay, I wanna deal with accessibility. I wanna deal with display errors, geometry, et cetera. I wanna deal with events, EFG events, and then dot sound, capital S. The capitalization of all of this does matter. No, not sound yet. Sorry, not sound. Uh, event, capital E, event. The capitalization of this stuff matters. There is some stuff that is uppercase, some stuff that is lowercase. I'll fully explain this in one moment, but let me type a couple more of these because we have to further say uh, import flash. Mm, events dot touch events and import flash media sound and import flash net URL re request. All right, so this is importing packages. The details of it, don't worry about it too much, but basically we're setting ourselves up to be able to interact. We're, be, we're setting ourselves up so that when our project is eventually on a real device, you will be able to tap it. You will be able to drag. You'll be able to do the two finger tap, three finger, et cetera. You'll be able to interact. There are events that we're going to keep track of. Uh, specifically touch events. There's going to be sound happening in our project. And then URL events related to um, the uh, the names of, uh, of, of content to load up. So everyone needs this. If you type it properly like this, that's all you really need to know about it. And this is our very first bit of code here so that the rest of our project properly works. We're also then going to basically activate touch capabilities. Now, when I do any coding in any of my classes, I write a lot of comments to kind of explain what the code does. I would recommend for you yourself, you also write comments. The ones that I write are fine. Or in your own words, you could write, add this to make it work. Right. You could write your own comments to give yourself your own notes in your own words. If my explanation doesn't make as much sense as it could, writing comments in your own words can help you. So here we'll type multi-touch 
dot input mode equal. Again, capitalization is very important. Um, action script related to JavaScript and the whole family of programming languages, capitalization matters. And so that's going to be the number one thing where you're going to have problems in this, in this section of the class. You didn't type something right. You know, multi-touch is not correct, but multi-touch is correct. Input mode is not correct, but input mode is correct. And how do I know the difference? In a sort of accelerated class like this, the you're not going to be able to, we're not going to be able to cover every detail, everything. And sometimes the why of things is not too important to get into. It's more important to know, you know, not the why, but the how. Why do I do this? No, the how do I do this is a little bit more important. How do I set up the capability to be able to interact in my project? This is, this is, this is how, you know, why is a capital M here and blah, 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 the, the how of it or the why of it? Don't worry about that. Furthermore, multi-touch input mode dot capital letters touch input. You know, why is it right, written like this? Don't worry about it. Just write it like this, and then it'll work. And this is the aspect of programming that even the pros, even the experts that have been doing it for years and years and years, we don't have everything memorized. We don't need to have everything memorized. We need to, however, be able to look stuff up. We need to be able to ask a question to colleagues, to more advanced people, to chat GPT, whatever. We need to ask a question to get an answer and then do our version of the code. And so what I want here is to be able to interact with, the, with, with what's on the screen. So you, this is what you do. Stop the project from... I'll write it as running away. We saw that with a movie, it'll play from frame one to frame one million and then repeat back to frame one. We saw that when we have scenes, it'll play from scene one to 10 on scene one and then go to scene two and play frames one to 50 and then go to scene three and play from scenes one to 90. And then when it gets there, it ends, it goes back to scene one, frame one. I don't want the project to run away. I don't want it to automatically play from beginning to end with no interactivity. One of the easiest commands, stop. Notice it's written specific way, parentheses, semicolons. Why? Because this is how it's supposed to be written. How do I stop my project from not playing automatically? This is the, this is the how. Then we've got listen for or wait for a tap on the help button and then move me to the help screen or help scene. Okay, so what I want to do is tap a button and go to another screen. The way this works in the code, I have to program it to detect when something is interacted with. And the something is the help button that's on the screen here. I'm, I'm waiting for, in computer language, I'm, uh, I'm listening for an event. I'm waiting for a tap on help. In computer language, um, I'm listening for an event. I've got two buttons. How do I know which one I tapped on? Well, I gave each of them an instance name. This help button has an instance name here. So the name of so the instance name. This is the number one issue that's going to happen here. Note. Use the instance name, not the symbol name. Lots of exclamation points to remind you. Don't type here the name of your object in the library. You're typing the name of the object on the screen. The name of the object on the screen has an instance name. By default, of course, it doesn't have an instance name. 
So if you even if you write the code perfectly, and then you test your project and you're clicking, 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 and nothing happens, you're not going to get an error message um, because it doesn't even know how to tell you your error. The computer is dumb. It doesn't know that that is supposed to be clicked on. You know it, of course. You can see a button. You can see that it's take me to help, but the computer has no way to know that, oh, that button is supposed to take me to help unless it has an instance name. So it's got an instance name. I'm referring to that instance name there and then dot add event listener, very specific spelling, parentheses, semicolon. There's an object on the screen. Let's listen for interactivity. Let's wait for something to happen with that object. Many things can happen. A regular tap, a two-finger tap, a tap and drag. There's those interactive elements. There's the interactivity of I'm fighting the boss and I'm weakening the hit points. There's the interactivity of I've taken the left path twice, and now on the third time, the ghost will appear. There's a lot of interactivity. I need to listen for an event. In the parentheses here, we can say object, wait for interaction. What kind of interaction? Do something. I'm breaking down the code here kind of in human terms. There's something I'm going to interact with. It's an object. Wait for some kind of interaction, dot interaction. Parentheses. In the parentheses, I need to write two things. Well, how am I interacting with it? Right click, tap finger, double tap. How am I interacting? Comma, after I detect that interaction, do something. And ActionScript, like any programming language, is full of 200 codes that are sort of like ingredients to do something else. You take eggs, sugar, flour, milk, and in different proportions, you add them together in the real world and you get either pancakes or you get a crepe or you get you know, a cake or whatever. If you further add extra ingredients, vanilla and whatever, you get different results. So a programming language is like ingredients. You know, the stop command is an ingredient, but how do I combine it with something else? Um, there's a command in here to keep track of the date. Okay, what do I use that ingredient with? Maybe if I detect that today is Halloween, my game will be in Halloween mode. So there's all of these ingredients. I can generate a random number. How does that random number help? Maybe today the random number says that the boss is extra difficult. Or today, randomly, the boss is extra weak. So the do something is usually a collection of pieces of code, of different built-in simple code that adds up to more complex code. So again, if you're a beginner to all of this, yes, it is complicated. It's learning a new language, but that's why this is all being recorded. That's where we're going to have the lab times. That's why I'm going to upload my example code. You should be able to do it. That's why you should be done. Ideally, you should have turned in your movie yesterday. Put that away already. Don't stress on it. I highly recommend finish the movie. Start on this because the end is near. Touch event dot touch tap, touch begin. So notice here, okay, we're interacting with something. How do we interact with it? Do we, inter do we wait for you to roll your phone? Do we wait for what else here? Uh, proximity movement. We have these various um, ways of interacting. I want touch tap. The, the spelling is very specific. Make sure you're doing it right, of course. And then the do something, kitty cat. Here, I typed it like this to show you. There's no such command as kitty cat, but maybe the meaning of kitty cat is that it's going to play a sound, the screen will flash, an animation will play, it'll take me to help screen. 
There's no built-in command that automatically flashes the screen, vibrates the phone, moves me to the next screen. There is a basic command to vibrate the phone. There is a basic command to uh, fade something out. There's a basic command to load a scene, but I need to combine those three basic commands into one new super command, which I'm calling kitty cat. So the do something here is, uh, is, is original code that is basically a combination of basic commands. And, these, and this here can be called anything I want. I'm calling it very obviously and very funny uh, kitty cat. But actually, we'll call this fn go to help. fn, I'll explain that in a moment. But I'm inventing a command. I'm inventing code basically called go to help. Go to my help screen. Go to help scene, whatever I want to call this thing. Kitty cat. I could call this, you know, command one. All of the stuff so far is built in action script that must be typed the right way or it won't work. What I'm writing at this point here is something I'm inventing on my own and I can call it whatever I want. I would recommend you call these things meaningful things for you to remember. And as I said, if you follow with what I'm talking about, um, it should work. You know, not to toot my own home, I, horn, I'm the instructor. I know what I'm doing. You probably should listen to me. And if you get it to work how mine is working, yours should work. So define what is fn go to help scene, a function. There's no such thing as fn go to help scene. So I'm about to define it. I'm about to invent it. Function fn go to help scene, copy and paste, parentheses, colon, void, curly braces, So the color coding of things also is a way to make sure it's working. Not that the colors, not that you need to memorize the colors, but let's say you're looking at your code versus my code. And in your case, your code is not the same color as mine. That's a quick indicator. Hey, wait a minute, something's wrong. Why is, why is the instructor's code purple and mine is black? Why is mine red, but then theirs is black? or blue or whatever. So here's just an indicator. Okay, Im oh, I see, I misspelled it, import. One letter could break the whole app, the whole game, one letter, not one, not one sentence, one command, one symbol, one character. Maybe I put a comma right here instead of a period. As I'm looking at hundreds of lines of code, I'm gonna lose track of that one comma. And when I run my code, error messages will pop up and the game won't work. And the error message will say, you know, unknown error, line five. So here I'm defining what does go to help screen mean. It has to be typed a very specific way. Type it the correct way like I'm typing it. You should be good. In the parentheses further, event, touch event. So this keyword function basically tells animate, I'm about to invent a new code. What's the name of the code? Kitty cat. Further boilerplate there that needs to be there. You just type it as is. You just type that as is. Curly braces here. Press enter to break this apart. Maybe put it on separate lines like that for readability. Make a note here and FN go to help scene. Race FN, oops. Quotes, fn go to help scene is running 
I'll come back to this in a moment. I'll add a little note here to be continued. Let me pause here. Line 17 and 19, in my case, your line numbers may be different, that's fine. But in my case, line 17 and 19 are two things you're going to do over and over and over and over. There is some thing you're going to interact with. You're going to listen for interaction. Most of the time, it'll be a tap event. So that'll be over and over. This will change here because do something after we detect interaction. This will this will change. This will be whatever you want it to be. You'll do that over and over. You'll also do over and over. Okay, I need to explain what that is that I'm going to do over and over. You're going to have function over and over, touch event over and over, void over and over, and then the end of the code here, and a trace. You're going to do this over and over. Um, If you can get the capitalization working right and vaguely why you're doing this, you'll be very successful in doing this project. Um, the details will change, of course. What is the specific thing I'm clicking on or dragging? Uh, define its specific interactivity, the details. Here's the part where, depending on a variety of factors, now we need to check how this is all working. Uh, we are no longer doing a you know control test movie like we were doing previously. Remember, one of the first things you need to do that I showed last week is make sure you create an Adobe, I mean, you create an Air for Android project. Even if you have an iPhone, I still want you to create this as an Android because when I test it and so forth and grade you, I have Android devices to test you with. Of course, the project can be a, an iPhone game later, but for the grade and such and for the learning of it, please set it up as an Android. I had also talked about last time that under edit, or sorry, under file, Android settings, you have to set up all of these um tabs and then we've got either control test movie on a, on my connected usb device or in the simulator now for some reason on my computer here at home my simulator always crashes i i don't know what curse my computer has but whenever i try to do this and do my lectures this always crashes so I'm not going to be able to do the air debugger launcher. You probably can do it no problem. You should do so. You can do the connect to my device. That usually takes longer. But for me, I have to do the device. And my Android device here that I've got ready for testing and such, I'm going to plug it in on my USB here. This first time should be kind of slow. But then subsequent time should be faster. When I go to File, Android Settings, Deploy. I also previously talked about the certificate and the like. I already created one previously, so I need to browse for it. My password. Save all of that, go back to settings. And uh, in my case, I've, I've plugged in an Android phone. I wanna turn on install on my Android, launch it. And there's my device. So file, Android, publish. Oops, message. All right.
right, so this this is good here. That I got an error just to confirm. Okay, so a couple of things. Uh, I started to write my code on the wrong layer, which doesn't really matter, but I should be writing my code on the actions layer. Okay, no big deal. I clicked on the wrong thing. So I'm gonna select all of that and cut it and put it into my actions layer. But more importantly, it's complaining. I think I mistyped something. So this is saying access of a defined property multi-touch input mode. I think I might've misspelled that. Multi-touch input mode, multi-touch input mode. Oh, mutli. It should be multi-touch, not mutli touch. So see, multi, even, see it didn't turn the right color, but I didn't think about it. So now it's correct, multi-touch input. And even me, to show you that I've been teaching this class for years and I do coding for years, you, you do mistakes once in a while. All right, so I fixed my mistake. I got a pop-up. We're gonna see this compiler uh, error screen a lot in the next few weeks. And what this pop-up tells you, location and description. This might look like gibberish to look at, but you do want to look at it in detail. Apologies if the sound outside, the trash is coming by. But this is saying on a particular scene, comma, on a particular layer, comma, on a particular frame, comma, on a particular line, comma, on a particular column. So yeah, I'm on my title scene. I'm on my background layer, actually my actions layer. I just moved it. I'm on frame one of my actions layer. And then if I scroll down to look line eight, it is further than saying access of undefined property multi-touch input. Now, unfortunately, error messages in any programming language are often very vague, um, very technical, very nerdy, very hard to understand what they're saying. Focus a little bit more on where your error is at, because this might be like, what is a what is a property, and what am I looking for? Basically, I misspelled. Why doesn't it just say you misspelled multi-touch? It's not smart enough to do that. No programming language is smart enough, which is funny. They're just not smart enough to fully tell you your errors. They're thinking like a computer. We're thinking like a person. We're better. We we know what we want. The computer doesn't. So focus on where is the error happening? In my case, line eight. And when I looked at line eight a couple more times, line eight, looking at it over and over, oh, I misspelled it. Mutley touch instead of multi-touch. So don't rely that it's going to tell you you misspelled it. Rely on where it happened, where the error was. I'm going to save that. Make sure you save often. Go back to publish. I've gotten another error. Okay. What's my other error? Um, oh, touch input. Okay. So let's see here. Access possibly undefined property. Touch input through a reference with static type class. What does that mean? No worries. Just check where it's telling you the error. Line eight. Again. Multi-touch input mode. Multi-touch input mode. Multi-touch input mode. Multi touch input mode dot touch input. Oh, that's it. Okay. Uh, sorry. It's not touch input, it's touch point. I am looking at my notes, but I don't know. Spaced out for a moment. So that should have been touch point, not an input. Uh, I did it wrong because I relied on the little pop up to appear. And then so alphabetically, touch input was first alphabetically. So I spaced out and I selected that one, but I needed touch point, which is a little bit lower in the alphabetization. So the pop-up helper is helpful often, but you know, if you're a little drowsy and such, possibly you might not notice the details. So make a note of that. It's touch point, not input. So one more time. File, settings, publish. All right, no error that time. This first time that I publish, it always takes a moment. You should check your code. You should write a little bit of code 
and then test it. Write a little bit more, test it. Don't write 50 lines of code and then write and then test it because then it'll one error might have added up to 20 lines later and it'll be a lot worse to, to deal with. So it popped up, this says success. No errors in my error panel. And now on my device here, if you're looking at me on the webcam, my app is there. It's overexposed, but trust me, it's there. I'm not going to change my, my webcam settings, but there it is. You can barely see it. So um, see, there it is. So my app is loading up on my device. And um, tapping on the help, um, tapping on the help, I haven't finished it yet, but tapping on the help is going to move me to my help screen. So for the moment, I just wanted to make sure, does it load up on my device? And you could have also instead go up to control test movie on the simulator. In my case, it's going to crash, so I'm not going to. Um, and so I figured out the two errors that that were there. And on our code, it doesn't go to the other screen yet. But I have a message here, trace something. So this was output a message to me. The trace command doesn't do anything except to tell you a message, to tell you any uh, note to yourself. As your app is running, maybe I think I wrote the code right and I'm tapping help, but nothing happens. I wrote my code perfect. Nothing happens. A trace statement, a trace command is a way to force feedback, a way to force a message to appear. I want that if this is all working, I tap the help button and I want it to, to display go to help is running or, you know, this is working. I want it to tell me a message when I interact. This is going to appear in the trace panel. Now, in order to see these messages, though, we need to go into the debug, into the debug mode, the debug view. I'm, I, I want to debug it. I want to remove the bugs, the errors. I want to see behind the scenes of the code. We've been doing this control test, or if you do publish, it kind of is assuming, yeah, this is the final result. It's the end. It's ready. But we're not ready, of course. We're still programming it little by little. We're still debugging it. So I would recommend to get used to, in the next few weeks, start to use the debug panel or command more than the control command. Because debug also says debug movie on a simulator or on a device. There's a big difference. Control test movie sort of finishes your movie. But debug, I'm still working on it, show me feedback. Show me error messages. Show me de uh, trace messages. So I'm going to go instead to debug, debug movie onto my device. I'm going to wait for it to load on my device. My screen will change a little bit to show me some extra panels. So that when I tap on the help button, I should see that trace message. And throughout our coding, we are going to use the trace command to give ourselves some feedback. See here, the screen changes, debug console, call stack variables, output at the bottom. My game is on my device here. I'm going to tap help. And what's that there down at the bottom here? It detected I tapped it. Help, go to help is running. If I tap it again, it detected it and I tap it 50 times. Every time I'm tapping it, oh, it's detecting I'm interacting. So the trace statement doesn't do anything, but also it does something very important. 
it gives you the feedback when you're interacting with your project. I have to go to debug and debug. So an extra step here. I need to get back to working on my project to close all those panels and get back to my code. But what I've shown here is that this trace, it's detecting every time I tap, there is a thing to interact with. Listen for interaction. Which type of interaction? A tap. Once we detect interaction, do stuff. What's the stuff? The definition of this stuff is just to say a message. What I'm going to do now that we know trace, quick message that my project has loaded. Trace, ready to rock, ready, ready to game. Control, or sorry, debug, test movie. Can I just click, click debug? Yeah. So what if I have a what if I have all of this code set up and the very first thing that I want my output to say is ready to rock? If I can see that, at the very least, I have my other code kind of basically set up, and then my subsequent code uh, will probably work. And so these trace statements, we're going to add them in several parts of the code to right here, ready to rock. This is at least saying, okay, this stuff is loading into memory, whatever, ready to rock. At least the game is currently running. And yes, on my webcam here, if you see me, the game is there. And then when I press the help button, it is detecting the run. It is detecting I pick up the key. It is detecting that I hit the boss. It is detecting that I went on the wrong path. It is detecting that my life points are low. This trace, These trace messages are gonna be very helpful to give you feedback. Because the system will definitely tell you when you did it wrong, but it almost will never tell you when you did it right. So we can ourselves program it to tell us that we did it right by using the trace command. So again, get used to here. Go to debug, debug movie. And when you're done, you want to do end debug session. Alt F12, I guess. Back to the code. So my code so far isn't really doing much, but I had set up these imports. I set up multi-touch capability. I stopped the timeline from running away. I gave myself a quick message that the basics of the app have loaded. I created a button to interact with. We'll do one more thing and then we'll take a break. Well, on the help screen, On the help screen, I want to click on help, go to help. On the code here, from the current uh, timeline, move to a new one. It's just typed in a very specific way, movie clip, capital M, capital C, parentheses, inside the parentheses, this dot root. Then at the end, after the parentheses dot, go to and play, parentheses. From the current timeline, which is basically all of this, move to a new one. Go to and play, go somewhere. Go to frame one, comma, in quotes, the name of a scene. Notice this little pop-up. When you use the go to and play command, you need a frame, comma, and then a scene. You need a frame, which is an object, which is a number, and then you need a scene, which is a string, which is a word, which is the name. The name of my scene two is SC help. 
the way I named SC Help, capital H. In quotes, don't forget the quotes, very important here. Don't forget to add quotes for your scene name, SC Help. You're going to do this over and over and over. This part, well, basically, basically all of this part, you're going to write this over and over and over exactly like this. And then you're going to then change it by what is the, what is the um, name of the scene. So remember to save. And you go to the debug. Let it compile. Subsequent times should be faster because the code, previous code has already been prepared and such. It just needs to upload the latest version to the device or the simulator. And what I want to see here on my device, I'm not going to be able to fully show it on the screen because my simulator doesn't work on this laptop, but on my device here. So the ready to rock message is there. I tap on help. Uh, I see the go to is running and this is ready to rock again, huh? I press it. This is go to help is running, ready to rock, huh? And if I look on my device, it's going to be subtle. You're not really going to see it on my webcam, uh, but I tapped help and the screen kind of blinked. Well, what is happening is literally reminding me computers are dumb because. It did exactly what I told it. Go to somewhere and keep playing the timeline. Go to frame one of scene two. Well, on scene two, it says my message, how to play, and it has one frame. And then when that, when that plays, it goes to the next scene, main, which is empty. And then when that plays and finishes, it goes to the next scene, end. And when that plays, it goes to the next scene, bad. And when that ends, it goes back to scene one and it reruns the code. It reruns the ready to rock. That's why I keep seeing ready to rock over and over. So we have go to and play and go to and stop. I'm mostly gonna use the go to and play as a sort of trap for all of you where Obviously, go to and play and then the runaway timeline. Go to and stop will stop you there. But I'm going to keep it as play because, okay, if I go to help, I want to add into the very first command here, stop the timeline, stop. You can stop the timeline of any scene, of any symbol. And so when we go to and play frame one help, it'll go there. And then from there, it'll read, oh, okay, when we're here, stop. So it'll stop here and show the how to play screen. So then we can interact here. So basically every scene, the first code you will have is, um, So every scene basically will have a stop right at the very top, unless it's the first scene, which is special. But every other scene is going to have right away stop. Stop here so that we can interact here, so that something can happen here. Unless you're advanced, and I shouldn't even put this into your head yet, but that you have some kind of animation first, and then we stop to then interact on that scene. Well, if it might be frame 50, that after my animation happens, frame 50, I got to stop. I could do it that way. Again, I shouldn't really be putting too many variables in your head yet. But for the future, after the code works, play some cool animation and then stop here and then click to interact and such. 
I'll take that back. Um, but here is our project so far. Set up basic things, stop the timeline, quick message to myself, my project is good so far. Set up interaction, what's the result of interaction? Let's take our first break here and then we'll keep going, but let me pause. Yes, if you're brand new to this, your head is swimming. I'll never be able to do this. No, of course you will. You watch the video, you, re you replay the video, you check my example code, you come to the lab for help, you'll be able to do it. I've shown you examples from previous semesters. They were able to do it. You can do it. I believe in you. Any questions before we go on to the break? Any clarifications on anything and such before we take our first break? Yes, no in the chat to tell me, and then we'll take a break. No questions. All right, let's take our first break. It's 125. We'll take a 10 minute break. Here's my code so far. I won't be able to show, you know, every line of code at all points. But as we take our first break, this is our, our first bit of code. I think it kind of all fits right there. This is all, well, it's all important, but here's all of the important code so far as we take our break. Actually, can I show it like this? You can screenshot it. And again, I'm going to put all of this on canvas. So don't feel like you know, everything, everything is that you'll lose it all. This is all our code so far, frame one. Uh, so take a break until 135, and then we'll uh, continue.
All right, everyone, let's go on. So what we want here is our code is taking us to the help screen. So now we need to deal with a little bit on the help screen. On the help screen, I'm not going to be grading on, um, you know, extra animation and um, visual stuff. I'm grading on, um, I'm grading on, the code. So whatever you want to have to have on the how to play screen, I would recommend you write something there about, you know, tap things to interact, try to drag and drop things, you could put a story here or whatever you want. But again, consider it when someone plays your game, they don't know your game at all. So why not help them a little bit? Uh, you could further create here's where you could go off icing on the cake, you could further create as a button here to go to some other scene that is story, SC story. And under that screen, the story, uh, the text moves onto the screen and you have an animation and a cinematic or whatever. But again, don't do the icing on the cake until you have the cake. And so let's say that I have the how to play here stuff. Okay, great. Now I want to go back to the game. Here is the programming of things you can program it that, okay, now that they know how to play, let's just start the game, go to, go to play the game. I'm gonna program it that we go over to, back to the title screen, and then they press play. If you can get that to work, great. If you can do the shortcut of from here, let's start to play, you can do that. But uh, again, I, I'm usually teaching the long way. You can do your shortcuts here and there and I'll point them out. So the long way is I'm gonna go back to the title. Now, there's gonna be instances of copy and paste and instances of writing it manually. I'm gonna write it manually for the moment to get the practice. And then once you kind of understand it, definitely consider copy and paste. So just to also show you here, make sure you're doing things where, where you expect. You've got your assets and such on a particular scene or on a particular layer. And then you've got, um, your code on a particular layer. So the little A will be a marker to let you know where your code is existing. And then the dots are where there's visual elements. So make sure you're writing the code where you expect it to be. So on my actions panel, I've got my stop command. So under actions, it's basically code to return back to the help. And again, like I said, I'm going to be kind of jumping back and forth a little bit with my example code. Yeah, okay. So what we need for there to go back is we need some button to go back to title. There's no buttons here. So I could create a brand new button or I could take a previously existing button and edit it somehow. I'll do it that way. I'm going to duplicate a previously existing button and change it a little bit. So right click duplicate. I will call this one help BTN back. Right. So then alphabetically, what I'm seeing is title button, title button, help button all the stuff that's in the help scene, in the title scene, et cetera. It's a button to go back. It's a button for help, a button for start. So that's how I'm going to name these things. And so that back button, I'll put a copy of it there. Maybe in this case, I will have it kind of bigger compared to my others, but I'm running out of space on how to what I'm writing for help and such. And I'll change this. Remember, you can double click it from the library so that you only focus on that element, that object. But sometimes you need to see this in relation to everything else. So the uh, other way to do that is to double click it on the timeline and see how the other things fade out. And I'm actually editing that object. So let me just change this, this button. Oh, 
this back. This needs an instance name. Don't forget to add instance names to all your interactive elements. Properties, instance name. So this will be back underscore BTN. You may have more, be careful about this. You may have more than one back button, let's say. Only one thing in the whole project at a time can have a certain instance name. You cannot rename seven, you cannot name seven um, objects on the screen with back button. They have to have unique, they have to have unique names. You could do back one, back two, back three. So the worst thing is that all the buttons are named the same. The second worst is that you have them named one and two and three. That's not as good because you're gonna lose track of button three, where does that exist again? What scene, I forget. The better thing, which I'm not doing, but the better thing is that I'm also have the prefix at the beginning. Well, this is my help scene. And in my help scene is where I've got the back button. So again, I'll do it slightly wrong so that you think a little bit outside the box on your own. Learning and following directions and listening exactly as you're being taught is a good starting point. But then with programming and anything that you do, then taking one step outside the box is a little better. You understand it more. It makes more sense to you. You know what you're doing and you can do it right. But the point is it needs an instance name. Okay, so in my... I put it on the wrong layer again, so maybe consider locking your layers. Lock your layers. And then unlock them as you work on them. That has an instance name. So now the actions, now the code. This scene just stops the timeline here. I don't need any of the other previous code about multi-touch and all of that. Uh, that was already set up on frame one, scene one. So here we just go directly to, I guess we can make a quick note. Note, no need for import and multi-touch code here. It's already done on frame one. But on this particular scene, on this particular frame, I do stop this timeline. And then I set myself up for an event listener. So the name of the button on the screen, dot add event listener, parentheses, semicolon, within the parentheses, typing this over and over, touch event, capital E, capital T, dot touch tap, all in caps comma, and then this is where this changes. So fn is a prefix commonly used to denote this is a function. This is a function that I invented. This is a set of code that I invented, a group of code, a chunk of code, fn function. This one is going to go back to the title. Go to title scene. I need to define the meaning of that. So I'm going to define this function. Which function? This function. I'm going to have the open and close parentheses. I'm going to have the void, colon void. I'm going to have the curly braces. So that I'm going to do over and over and over. Function, something, colon, or parentheses, colon void, parentheses, or curly braces. I'm going to do that over and over. But what changes is the what function am I talking about? Well, the one I'm trying to use here. I'm trying to use a function. It doesn't exist yet. Let's make it exist over and over because this is all based on events or interactivity, specifically touch event. I'm going to write that over and over. So um, event touch event. 
break these curly braces. This is optional, but I always like to write a little note here. This is my end of FN go title. This doesn't need to be typed exactly. It's a comment. It's a note. It doesn't need to be exactly the same. People say, hey, you misspelled it. It doesn't need to be the same. It's a note. But I will write it right. Title scene. And uh, the point of this, it's optional, but the point of this is when there's a little curly brace like that floating around all by itself, you're going to lose track of it, especially if you've got hundreds of lines of code. Like, where does this curly brace, where does this curly brace belong? Who does it belong to? Yes, there's a little line here that kind of touches or connects it back here to kind of remind you that it's all connected. But if you lose track of it, why not instead have a little note there? to give you a quick visual marker for yourself. And then a trace message to tell myself in quotes, FN go to title is running. Even before I make it really do what I want it to do, it's a very good idea to have this message at the beginning so that when you debug your code, you will, you will get the feedback that at least I'm trying to tap and it is detecting the tap. I might've written the code properly and I'm tapping and nothing happens because it'll tell you when you did it wrong, but it won't tell you when you did it right. You might say, well, that's wrong. I'm tapping and it doesn't do it. Isn't that wrong? No, not to the computer. If you wrote the code right, it's right because we have logic errors and we have syntax errors. Syntax errors is that I misspelled the word event or that I wrote events. That's a syntax error. There's no such thing as events, but there is event. And on touch event, there's no such thing as touch event, but there is such thing as touch event. That's a syntax error. You're not typing exactly the pre-made code. Logic errors are harder to deal with because this is sort of like the one plus one equals two. Does one plus one equal two? Logic errors. Okay, does one plus one equal two on a Tuesday versus a Wednesday? More complex questions and, and such that the computer doesn't fully know the answer to. So putting a trace message helps give feedback to yourself to see if it's working. And I do recommend as a beginner to test your code often. The code is not quite complete, but I'm going to test it. Because now I've got interactivity on my help screen. I've got detect a tap. If tap is detected, say a message. If all of that works, then I'll write the code to move me from screen to screen, which will look very familiar than what we've seen already. So let's see my output here. I got the ready to rock. My code is basically set up um, on my Android. I'm pressing help. I get the feedback. Go to help is running. I've gone to the help scene. Now on that feedback, on my Android, I see that I'm on the help screen. On my feedback here, again, it doesn't tell you if you did it right. So maybe I'll add another trace. Uh, but anyway, I've got the back button on my Android phone. I'll press the back button on my Android. And it's got the detection here. Go to title is, is running. So it's detecting that I'm tapping on that button. It's not actually going there yet, but it's detecting. And that is all just to get used to. Write some code, save the code, debug the code, test the code. So what I want to do here, maybe optionally... Uh, note where I am. So trace. Now at scene help. So whenever I go to that screen, I will see that message. To finish this code, well, very similar to before, movie clip, almost exactly the same as before, movie clip dot go to and play, parentheses, 
I need to fill in the details in this current timeline, move us to some other timeline. This root, you write that over and over, always exactly the same. Which frame? Frame one, usually. You can do some other interesting advanced things if you tell it to go to other frames. But I'll do it the simple way for the moment. In quotes, go back to my title, scene title. Again, thinking slightly outside the box, slightly ahead, if only there were a way to program this to directly start my game. Why do I need to go back to title and then start to play? I learned how to play, why don't I just start to play? If only there were a way to program that. Hmm, I gotta think about that. Hmm. Anyway, so that's my help screen. Obviously you're gonna make it better than that, but on version one, version zero, you're gonna make the code work, then you'll put the icing on the cake. So let me debug this just to make sure that's working and uh, debug my movie. I will be interacting on my device it's maybe a little faster on the simulator, but I have to do it on my device. All right, so it's on my device. I get my output down there. Ready to rock. Maybe I'll change that. Loaded title scene, right? You can make these things say anything you want. So I go to help. Uh, go to help is running now at help. So I'm on my help scene and it's on my webcam as well. And I press the back button. Go to title is running, ready to rock. So that's working so far. Little by little. All right, so the other button that I've got to actually start to play is a start button. That's gonna be where I can do a little copy and paste instead of writing it manually. Little time saver. I need that button to be interactive. And when I tap it, go to another whole screen here. So I'll fix that in a moment, but I've got something on my main screen here. So code. I need to make my start button interactive. So here's, here's where you have to decide, is the copy and paste easier or should I just write it manually? Let me show you how the copy and paste could be. All of this code right here is basically the code that you need to make a button be clickable. So what if I copy all of that? and then paste it. Obviously I need to change it. I'm not dealing with the help button anymore. I'm not dealing with go to help anymore. I'm not making it go to help anymore. It saved me the effort of copy and paste so I don't have to rewrite event listener and touch tab and touch event and event and void and function. I don't wanna maybe mistype something. So that's a little time saver that the spelling and such is typed for me if I copy and paste but I still have to change at least one, two, three, four things. So you weigh what is better. Copy and paste, write it manually. I myself would probably copy and paste, but I know that I need to change those four things. Writing it the long way is longer, but then you, 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 you're sure that everything is typed properly. So number one thing here, well, note, make a start button clickable, take me to main screen. So 
So the start button. All that's the same. Now this is different FN go to main scene. So now this needs to match with this. I'm also going to delete this comment that gets in my way here. Now I need to make that be the same. Make sure this and this match, it's all going to be a pair, basically. This and this will be a pair over and over. And make sure that this matches this, whatever this is. Kitty cat one, two, three, kitty cat one, two, three. Make sure it matches. This should match with that. Trace this. Okay, well, this is my go to main screen. From the current timeline, move me somewhere. Frame one of scene main. And when I click on that, it will go to scene main. Well, on scene main, runaway train, runaway timeline. So make sure you've got an actions. Make sure the first thing on your brand new timeline is a stop. Maybe say a quick message now at C main. Debug that. You want to save as soon as possible. I've, I'm, I've been in the habit because I've been doing computers and programming and all of that for years and years and years. I write one line of code and right away control S. My, my hands are already on the keyboard, so I just get in the habit about like, everything I write right away control S, save it. So what does my output say here? I changed it instead of ready to rock just to be more obvious. Okay, I'm on the title screen at the moment, cool. When I click help, I went to help, that works. I press back, I go back to title, that works. I'm back at title, I press start. I, it detects you're pressing go to main, and now I'm at main and on my webcam, not really visible, but I'm on the main screen, I'm seeing the little face. So far, so good. We will be doing something like that over and over. I'm gonna do something like this again, but this time more interactive. We're gonna jazz it up by putting a little animation on the screen when you interact. All of this has been static. Obviously, to make it feel more like a game, there's more interaction. And so what I'm going to do here, again, all of you are following along, and you're going to do a certain thing. But if you get the code to work, then you go back and do the icing on the cake. We're all going to be ex exploring a haunted house. But that doesn't make sense for my particular movie. No, of course not. But you need to learn how to do this. Worry more about the code than make it your own forest instead of a haunted house. But we're going to make a haunted house that we're going through. So what we're going to see here at first is a gate, a road and a path and a gate. So I'm not going to stress too hard about the details. But I'm going to draw a very simple path and a gate. I don't know, something like this. Here's a thing. Here's a little path. Probably lower here in the perspective, a little path. There's a fence over here. There's a gate, I guess. It's got a door, I guess. Bricks and all of that. I can fully add that later colors and all of that later. Spikes on the gate later. I can fix all of this later. So the uh, interactive element is going to be this door. Now, here's where you have to think. Everything that's going to be an interactive element should be on its own layer. 
and must be a symbol. So before I get too far in all of the details here of the icing on the cake, I need to think about what is going to be interactive. On my scene one, there's these buttons, which I'm throwing everything onto the background layer. It works okay, but things should be on their own layer when they're interactive. I sh a little bit better would be here, a layer, let's say, called buttons. And these buttons cut and paste in place on their own layer. The background is on its own layer. The buttons are on their own layer. The code is on its own layer. If you didn't see what I did, don't worry, replay the recording. You don't have to do this, but if you want to. Now moving forward here on this main screen, that door is gonna be interactive. I'm gonna set this up so that this door is on its own layer and it's its own symbol. So I did start to draw it. Um, I did start to draw it here. But now that I'm telling you, when you do your own version eventually, uh, this door, I want it to be interactive and I want it to animate, I want it to swing open. So I'm going to, at this point with my select tool, for example, select the lines of the door. And here I'm using the lasso, I'm holding shift, so then further select so i selected the lines of the door but i have that background layer but then I'll have a new layer just for the door. Right click paste in place. So I take it from exactly where I first drew it. If I do a regular paste, it'll paste somewhere and I have to nudge it into place. Well, why not let it automatically paste it in place to the fraction of a pixel. So even though to the user, to the player, it looks like all a complete thing, you're going to be putting different interactive elements on their own layer. So now if I hide there, I've got the door on its own layer. And before I proceed, now I need to turn that simple those simple lines into a symbol so that then I can interact with it. So I'm going to select. Also, now that it's on its own layer, when I try to select, it's only selecting the stuff on that layer. I locked my other layers. So that's one way to access to make sure you accidentally don't interact with other things on, on the screen. The door is on its own layer. Select the door F8, turn it into a symbol. We'll call this main uh, main door on the main screen. This is a door or a gate or whatever. And so when I tap it, I want it to swing open. I want it to animate open. I've got this as a movie clip, so it can have its own timeline, its own animation, its own tween, its own fade in, fade out, blending. It's, it can do its own thing. And when I tap on the door, this one is not gonna be complex, just open the door. Another one is gonna have, use a key. But on this one, it's just a tap to open. So 
I'm going to double click it here so that I'm now in the timeline of the door. Let's see, there's many ways to do this. Okay, also what I'm going to do is um, to learn this, whatever you're, you're drawing, I, I'm, I'm going to, I think I'm going to put like a bright red color as well to show that something's interactive. Again, I can change this whenever in the future. But let's say later I've got, again, 10 torches on the wall, but one of them is the correct one. As I'm, as I'm programming it and setting it up, the interactive one is going to be bright red. Later on, it'll, it'll be normal. <laughs> I can fix that later. But for, for this moment, this is going to be interactive. Just color it. And I'm going to animate it opening. So it's going to swing open to the, to the, to the left on its right. So frame five, F6. Free transform tool. It's going to flip over. If I just start to kind of flip it over like this, so eventually it's going to flip over, right? But not flip over literally. It's going to swing over. So by using the transform tool, and this center point that a lot of you, when you were trying to move your things, you were pressing that and it's like, what, what's this doing? What am I doing here? That little circle there is where does it rotate from? So if I um, have this somewhere to the left here, now when I transform it here, it's gonna be rotating from that point. Obviously I need a shadow to move and a creaking sound and all of this icing on the cake that we will do later but I want this to flip over like this, like the door opened. Well, I need to draw it in perspective. Yes, icing on the cake. But what I'm trying to set up here is that frame one, then on frame five, F6, um, skip two frames over, F6, move your little rotation point to the left, where I will kind of Start to rotate it a little bit. Skip two frames over, F6. Make sure your rotation point is there again. Move it over a little bit more. Skip two more frames, F6. Rotation, bring it over here. How do I know how much to move it over? As a beginner, you don't really know how much. You'll get a feel for it. It can be mechanically X number of pixels, but, but um, don't worry too much. Here's our animation. I need to draw hinges and all of that. Yes, later, icing on the cake. So when I click on that, it's going to swing open. See what I've done here in the movie clip of the door. There's an animation. But if I... See, can I do this easily here? Test scene. Okay, that'll be all right. So I as soon as I get to the as soon as I get to the scene, the door is opening and closing on its own. Is there a ghost here? Well, obviously, I don't want the door to move until I interact. I have a command to stop a timeline. But I had I thought it did stop. I have the stop command here on main, but yeah, I have the stop command on main. I don't have the stop command in that movie clip. Movie clips have their own timeline, their own world. They do, the, they do things on their own unless you program them right. So in the timeline of the door, I'm gonna need a layer of actions, a layer of code. on frame one of the actions layer of the door. Stop the door swing. And get used to this panel on the side here. This will tell you all the scenes and frames that have 
code. Plus, it'll tell you all of the symbols that are on the time on the on the various timelines. All the various symbols and um, wh where their code is at. Well, thinking a little bit ahead, I'll head, it, head you off at the pass. When the code plays, unless you program it, it will loop back, right? And then keep opening and closing. So after the open happens, stop the animation of the loop so that more can happen. Um, the code here, just a moment. On the code here, the... The um, we need to trigger code to to happen once we reach uh, frame seventeen. We want the door to be stopped until we interact, then start to play. So jump to frame two, play those frames, then stop at seventeen, leave the door open, and the whole point of opening the door is that then I go to the next scene. Once the door is open, take me to the next scene. So. The um, code, we, we need to, we need to say, um, We need to say to stop when we get to the frame 17. So we need an F7 here. We need a blank keyframe anywhere where either new animation happens or new code happens. That's where you have um, a blank keyframe, F7. So when we get to 17, stop here, stop after the door opens. Now that the door is open, move us to the next scene. That code is coming in a moment, but I want it to stop. Now also thinking a little bit ahead, in my mind, the door creaks, we'll add sound later. The door creaks open and uh, then we move to the next scene. But what you have to remember again is time. Things People often do things too fast on their movies and on their games because the computer does it too fast. It's a machine that goes at 24 frames per second. This uh, door opens up and then right now it's stopped, but it's not programmed to stop until I stop it. And then when we move to the next scene, well, I want I want it to be visible for a moment that the door has opened and then move us to the next scene. So actually, I want this to happen maybe somewhere after one second or so. I want it to continue to show the, the open door and then move us to the next scene. So the code is going to happen further over here somewhere. So literally these frames existed, but Again, thinking further, the, the frames animate, we need to stop there, pause there, then move over. The pause is happening right here. Show this frame and then a little pause. And then the code to move us to the next scene. This is where now, beyond where over the weekend, you had to create a title scene, help scene, main scene, good send scene, end scene. Okay, now we're going to be in the... We've gone past the gate of the scary house, the, the haunted house. Now we need to get into 
the scary house. Well, before you get into the scary house, there's a front door. Here's where we'll start to get interesting. Do I want to go in the front door? Do I want to go in the back door? Do I want to go in through the chimney? There's all of these paths that you can take to get into the next part of things. So I need a new scene. Uh, so I want to create a new scene. The order of the scenes do not matter. You can have them in any order because you're going to jump non-linearly non throughout your game. But for myself, what makes sense to me is that the scenes are in the order that I'm kind of interacting with them. So I will put them in some order that makes sense to me. And so this will be scene front door. Maybe I'm thinking, okay, maybe I shouldn't call it scene main. I should call it scene gate. I would recommend to call it that scene gate, but then you also need to change your code. Wherever your code says go to scene main, you, you need to set it to go to scene gate. If you change the name of your scene, obviously, if it's not obvious, computers are dumb. We know what we want, computers don't. And if the scene is called ABC, and now your code is saying go to one, two, three, well, of course it won't work. It needs to say scene ABC, go to scene ABC. I'm gonna keep it as main, but you probably want to call it as SC gate. And if you leave it as SC gate, that's fine. You're not gonna get a bad grade. It's got, the code's got to work. But now there's a front door. Do I want on the front door? Um, further path to another door, perhaps. Yes, we will need to um, break this into correct. Um, Symbols a little later. Getting too fancy here, but okay. Got a scary house. A couple of gargoyles here later and here too. If you're doing yours is in a forest or a post-apocalyptic battle zone. Yes, you'll need to change your art later. But now I've got a brand new scene to go to. After I get past the gate, I'm at the front door to further interact. Here's where I can, okay, do I go to the, do I climb the tree, then get on the second floor, go into this window? Maybe this window's open. This one's closed. Uh, there's a front door here. What about these other windows over here? So the way this is going to work, um, we're going to have two interactive elements. We're going to have the, um, the front door and this big old window before that on the main door on the main scene here we were setting up that we tap the door it opens up and then it takes you to the next scene so finishing this code here the door swings open now that the door's open move us to the next scene hey this is familiar that movie clip root code Here's where you can copy and paste, go back to any instance where elsewhere you set up the code that, that worked previously. This is the code I need here. Movie clip this route, go to and play somewhere. I need that code again, right here. Obviously I need to change it. The only thing to change is what's the actual scene I'm going to. All of this is exactly the same from the current timeline, go somewhere, probably frame one, some scene. Well, brand new scene, which I forget already what I called it, uh, front door. So go to SC front door. When the door opens up, take me to the front door. All of that will happen once I click the front door. It'll animate, it'll take me to the front door. So my code 
in my main gate. All it says is stop here. So I need to make the door clickable. Once the door clicks, run some code to proceed. So here's, again, something is clickable. Do something about it. So I'll try the copy and paste. Wait for door to or gate to be clicked. Then play the animation of the door opening. Then move us to front door scene. So something will be interacted with. Once that interacted, interaction happens, something will happen. The definition of that something follows here. We're gonna give ourselves a quick message. Something is happening. From our current timeline, do something. Actually, this one is gonna be different. So we'll comment it out. Do something. But let me fill in some details here. Okay, so I'm interacting with something. What am I interacting with? I'm interacting with the door. Oh, I need to give the door an instance name. Right? The code won't know what you're clicking on. This has no instance name. It has a name in the library, but no instance name. So we need to give it some name. So we'll call this um, main gate button. Give it some name. Enter to lock it in. This has a unique name now, instance name. Back to my code. That thing, wait for something, wait for a touch, do code, fn, play gate anim. Not a go to front door, it could be, it's that's not actually what's happening technically. I have to wait for the animation of the door to play. Then when the door animation plays, when the timeline of the door animation of the gate playing, when that triggers frame uh, 24 or whatever, that then takes me to the front door. So you could keep it as you've been doing it before, whatever the logic of, of for you is fine. F and go to, um, what did I call it? Uh, front door. Ultimately, that's what happens. Technically, all that we're doing is playing the animation of the gate. Then the gate takes over, and when it plays, takes us to the front door. Again, if you follow me exactly and mine works, yours will work. And anytime you want to deviate, fine. Make sure it works, though, whatever makes sense to you. I've defined a brand new bit of code. So further, that needs to match. And further, that needs to match. So that is now interactive, and the interactivity that I want is the do something here, play the timeline of the gate so it triggers, go to front door, main gate, button, play.
a gate has an animation that swings open. We don't want it to swing open automatically. It has a stop on frame one. Now that I've tapped on it, start to play frame two, three, four, five, one million. So its timeline is going to start to flow. The timeline of the gate will flow. It'll get past the stop. It'll flow. It'll play the animation. It'll hit this timeline frame. This one says, take me to the front door. Stop here so that the animation doesn't loop and then take me to the front door scene. Okay, so I'm showing here, back on frame, back on title scene, I'm showing simple navigation with click on this, go directly to a scene. The, the example code is there. In scene, and there's two paths to take here. On scene two, it's just one path to go back. Okay, then on scene three, it's one path, only one clickable thing, but now this is happening after an animation plays. So what if, when we learn a little bit more, what about if you learn that when you tap the boss 10 times, an animation plays of it's dying, and then you go to the happy ending? We're, st we're still not there yet. But now what I'm showing here is, what if you play animation? What if, what if you move in, move around your game after some kind of animation has happened, this is just reinforcing that even though there's one frame on the gate scene, what's happening is that the gate object is animated and then it takes you to the next place. And the next place is the front door. One final thing, then we'll end for the day and then we'll triage. But on this scene, I want it, I want the actions. The action that I want here is stop me on this scene, trace me now at scene front door. Debug me. No, no errors when I went to debug. That's one of the reasons also you want to save and debug often. So it, it'll pop up if any errors happen, misspellings and the like. So you can go to the particular scene and frame. And now you have to also then think about a particular symbols, timeline, and line number of error. But the pop-up will tell you. So you can't see me on my webcam very easily, but that's why I've got those outputs there. So ready to rock now a title. No need to, but I'll go to help again. Okay, I'm at help. Now at help, good. Press back, back a title, good. Go to the start. Okay, I got my date, my gate, um, my gate screen. Now I'm at main. I tap on the gate, Ooh, it animated on my on my phone really cool. And then it says, uh, play gate animation is running, now at scene front door. So on my webcam, if it's visible, now I'm at the front door. So how do I go back to the previous screen? You need to fully program that, we'll get to it. But everything that we do in our projects, we have so many ideas. Well, what about if I instead, uh, you know, try to press that brick that looks weird compared to the other bricks. Yes, you can do all of that. Don't bite off more than you can chew. We're in the lectures here. We're going to do the basics of it all. If that works, A+. plus. If you wanted to make it do more and do this whole side quest and all of that, don't do the side quest stuff to the detriment of the main stuff that I'm asking for in the game, in the assignment. Don't get off on a path. Don't let your whimsies get the better of you. Um, do the basics of what I'm asking, and then after that, you can make it do more. So this is a lot today. We're at the end of the day. So 
the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to upload my finished FLA file into Canvas. I'm going to upload my, my project at the moment. Mine works. So if you're having trouble, you can open my file, look at my code, copy and paste my code, I guess. Look at my file, make sure my code, your code matches my code. This is all being recorded. You can go back, pause, replay the recording. You can come to help on Wednesday, this Wednesday, and then Monday, Wednesday to get help. It's going to be a lot harder to help you online. So all of you that have been online in per online instead of in person this whole semester, I recommend start to come to class. It's going to be a lot harder to help you over Zoom and such. Um, I'm going to upload. I don't know if it'll be as helpful, but I'm planning on. I will also upload here under the resources. I'm planning on um, making a section here, you know, scene one, and I'll just paste all the code here. Scene two, and I'll paste all the code here. I don't know if that's going to be as helpful as uh, also uploading my file. I'm definitely uploading the file. I'm going to also upload the, the raw code, although out of, out of context, the raw code might not make a lot of sense. It needs to make sense, of course, that I'm on my title scene, so my code here makes sense. But I'm going to do all that I can, me and the assistants, so that all of this makes sense and that it works. I'm going to end the recorder in a moment. We'll do a little quick question lab time sort of thing, but then I got to go to my other class. And then the recording will be added later today, and we'll be back on Wednesday. I'm planning on being there in person on Wednesday. Today, I quite couldn't, but I'll be there on Wednesday and some of the assistants as well. So um, week seven, day one of CIS 126.